Hello, my name is Dr. Lisa Sun. I'm a pediatric stroke neurologist at Johns Hopkins, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to talk to you today about stroke in infants and children. In this module, we'll be talking about the epidemiology, presentation, and risk factors for childhood stroke. The objectives of the talk today will be to first understand how we classify pediatric stroke and the different categories that we think about when we're conceptualizing stroke in infants and children. We'll then review the clinical presentation of different types of pediatric stroke. We'll discuss the epidemiology of stroke in infants and children. And then we will review common risk factors and etiologies of pediatric stroke. The most important message I hope you can take away from today's lecture is that I hope everyone can recognize that infants and children can have strokes, and that should always be part of your thought process when you're evaluating a child with a neurologic process. We won't be covering outcomes and treatment in this module, but we'll be talking about that in the second of this two-part series. Starting with the classification of pediatric stroke, we divide pediatric stroke into a few different categories. Falling within the umbrella of pediatric stroke is intracranial hemorrhage, secondly, arterial ischemic stroke, and finally, venous stroke. The focus of today's talk will be on pediatric arterial ischemic stroke. We further categorize that into perinatal stroke and childhood stroke. So starting with childhood stroke, um, childhood stroke is stroke that occurs between 28 days of life and 18 years of life. Um, childhood stroke is what we typically think about when we think about stroke, and so this uh, differentiation is important not only for understanding how children present and how we treat them, but also causes of stroke. Childhood stroke often presents similarly to adult stroke. Focal neurologic deficits are a really common presentation of childhood stroke, similar as in adults. The same uh, symptoms that we look for in adults, such as facial droop, arm weakness, or speech difficulty, are the same things we can see in children at the onset of their stroke. One important difference is that children are more likely to have a stuttering course on the, at the onset of their symptoms, as opposed to an adult in which, uh, in which scenario they will often have deficits that are maximal at onset. A child's course can wax and wane early on in the stroke process. Nonspecific symptoms, such as headache and altered mental status, are more common in children when compared with adults. Um, and so these are things that in an adult may lead us away from a diagnosis of stroke, but in a child it is very consistent with an acute stroke. The most important difference between the presentation of adult stroke and childhood stroke is that focal seizures are very common at the onset of stroke in children. With regards to childhood arterial ischemic stroke, that is the initial manifestation of more than 20% of childhood strokes, and that's 18 folds higher than in adults. A very common presentation of stroke in children is to have a new onset focal seizure with subsequent deficits that, that don't rapidly improve. Returning back to our classification, we'll now focus our attention on perinatal stroke. And perinatal stroke is stroke that occurs between 20 weeks gestation and 28 days of life. Perinatal stroke is further broken down into two different categories based on the way the stroke presents. And these ca categories are neonatal stroke and presumed perinatal stroke, or presumed perinatal arterial ischemic stroke, PPAIS. Neonatal stroke typically presents with focal seizures on the first day of life. Children that have strokes at around the time of birth may present with fairly refractory seizures that tend to last for several days after birth until we can get them under control or they self-resolve on their own. Neonatal strokes should be high on your differential diagnosis of any newborn that has new strokes or new seizures at the time of birth. These children may have some encephalopathy or some tone changes, but it's very rare to have any focal deficits for uh, for newborns at the time of stroke. The other way perinatal stroke can present is as a presumed perinatal stroke, 
And in these cases, the birth history tends to be very unremarkable and the child does very well at the time of birth. However, typically around four to six months of age, the family will notice that the child has early handedness, unilateral fisting, or increased tone on one side of the body. This may be picked up by the parents or may be picked up by the pediatrician at a routine visit. And pictured here is a child with unilateral fisting um, and early handedness. Children should not, um, should not have a hand preference before the first year of life. And if they do, that should raise suspicions for a perinatal stroke. With regards to the epidemiology of pediatric stroke, we'll start with perinatal stroke. Perinatal stroke is ischemic 80% of the time and hemorrhagic 20% of the time when we exclude patients with prematurity related intraventricular hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. The incidence of perinatal stroke is about 1 in 3,500 live births, which is fairly common. Childhood stroke, on the other hand, is about half ischemic and half hemorrhagic. The incidence of childhood ischemic stroke ranges from about 1 to 8 per 100,000 person years. And the wide range of incidence um, is due to differences in the way different studies are conducted, with higher incidences reported in studies that utilize radiology findings and databases to ascertain which children have had a stroke. Childhood stroke is more common in boys compared with girls, which is not a difference that we see in perinatal stroke. So the most common question I get is why does a child have a stroke? And the answer to that really depends, first of all, on if the stroke is a perinatal stroke or a childhood stroke, which is why that differentiation is very important. With regards to perinatal stroke, we typically think that most perinatal strokes are multifactorial and related to a coalescence of multiple risk factors that converge around the time of delivery. We know that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state with complex interactions of maternal and fetal circulations. We also know that this is an, a time of high stress and inflammatory response, and all of these things together can predispose to clot formation. We believe that most strokes are related to thrombosis at the level of the placenta with embolization across the pain frame and ovale. Many studies have looked at different risk factors for perinatal stroke and have found variable findings with neonatal sepsis and chorioamnionitis being the most consistent risk factors for perinatal stroke. For these reasons, and we'll, we'll get to this a little bit more in the second module, we don't typically treat children with perinatal stroke with antithrombotic therapy because we think that the risk factors are really isolated and confined to the time of birth. This treatment depends a little bit on the diagnostic workup, which we'll discuss more in the second module. The risk factors for childhood stroke are much more variable. Cardiac disease is one of the more common risk factors for childhood stroke, present in about a third of children with childhood stroke. Arteriopathy is the other big risk factor, and this is a, a problem intrinsic to the blood vessels of the head or neck that predisposes to childhood stroke. There are many other risk factors for stroke, which we always think about when we're evaluating a child that has had a stroke. And these include thrombophilias, sickle cell disease, genetic or metabolic disorders, connective tissue disorders, inflammatory issues, cancer, infection, trauma, and critical illness. Importantly, when we're looking for risk factors for childhood stroke, we often find multiple. So in this study that looked at the number of risk factors uncovered in a child with, with, that has had a stroke, a lot, most of the children had one risk factor, but a good number, um, actually the, the majority had more than one risk factor, um, ranging from anywhere from two to six different risk factors for stroke identified. And this is very important because we know if we identify one risk factor, such as infection or trauma, 
that doesn't mean that we can stop our evaluation. We really have to have a thorough evaluation to understand why a child has had a stroke. I'll also point out that a reasonable number of patients with childhood stroke have no risk factors uncovered. And this, these are the strokes that we categorize as cryptogenic strokes. And unfortunately, this remains a, a fairly high, um, uh, at the end of the day, we all often ultimately do come to this conclusion that we have no risk factors that, are, that we can modify or counsel families on. The benefit of that population is that the risk of stroke recurrence is fairly low if you don't uncover any risk factors. So moving a little bit more into the more common causes of pediatric stroke, we know that head and neck arteriopathies are found in about half of children that have had strokes. As I mentioned before, cardioembolic uh, strokes account for about 30% of pediatric strokes. And for these reasons, um, we'll talk a little bit more detail about these specific risk factors. Starting with cerebral arteriopathies, again, we know this is a major risk factor for childhood stroke occurring in about half of children that have had a stroke. Um, and this has been looked at in many studies, but um, in the largest study, which was the International Pediatric Stroke Study, looked at a multinational registry of children with stroke and found that 53% had an arteriopathy. This is particularly important because we know that cerebral arteriopathy is a predictor of poor short-term outcome and a very strong predictor of stroke recurrence with a five-year cumulative stroke recurrence rate in children with arteriopathy as high as 66%. And so one of the major things we look for when evaluating a child with a stroke is a really thorough evaluation of the blood vessels in the head and the neck to understand if there are things we can do to prevent stroke recurrence in these children. There are many different causes of arteriopathy in children. The most common classification in the International Pediatric Stroke Study is something called a focal cerebral arteriopathy. This is defined as an unexplained focal stenosis or segmental narrowing in a vessel wall, typically the large intracranial vessels. Within this category, we have transient cerebral arteriopathy, which is a monophasic non-progressive arteriopathy that may progress or um, progress over about six months, but after the six month mark, stabilizes or improves. Within this category is something called post varicella angiopathy, which is a, a vascular response to the, a varicella infection. The, the pathophysiology of transient cerebral arteriopathy and more broadly focal cerebral arteriopathy is not well understood but is thought to be the end result of potentially multiple pathologic mechanisms, including infection, trauma, and inflammation. And we think that infection and inflammation may be an important part of this pathogenesis because it is a, a major predictor of focal cerebral ar arteriopathy is a preceding upper respiratory infection. And this is something that's actively being studied in a study called the VIPS study, which is ongoing. Another common cause of arteriopathy is a cervical arterial dissection. This accounts for about 10 to 20% of all pediatric stroke um, and is a very common cause of both pediatric and young adult stroke. In cervical arterial dissection, there is a little tear in the luminal wall that often results from rapid neck rotation or hyperextension or neck trauma. What happens is that blood cells accumulate in the tear in the blood vessel wall and form an intramural thrombus, which you can see very nicely in this pathologic picture. This can cause stroke by multiple mechanisms, including uh, intraluminal extension of the thrombus and subsequent embolization. We can appreciate on this uh, image, this is a, an MR angiogram, um, that you can see that the left vertebral artery has this tapering appearance that's very suggestive of an arteriopathy. Um, and in this case, this was a dissection that extended uh, almost to the basilar artery. 
Another common cause of arteriopathy in children is moya moya arteriopathy. Moya moya means puff of smoke in Japanese, um, and it describes the classic angiographic finding in this entity. Moya moya arteriopathy is a progressive spontaneous occlusion of the intracranial vasculature at the level of the circle of Willis, typically beginning with the distal internal carotids and proximal middle cerebral and anterior cerebral arteries. And this is typically a progressive process that worsens over time. There's a bimodal age distribution with a childhood peak at about four years of age where children will often present with ischemic symptoms and ischemic stroke. Adults tend to present in their 30s or 40s, typically with hemorrhage. We categorize two different types of moya moya arteriopathy into moya moya disease and moya moya syndrome. In moya moya disease, this is when moya moya occurs not in association with another disease process. We, feel, we think that most of these are genetic causes, some of which have been identified and some of which remain to be identified. Moya Moya syndrome, on the other hand, is when this same pattern of arteriopathy is related to an underlying syndromic diagnosis. In adults, the most common cause of Moya Moya syndrome is atherosclerosis. Um, cranial irradiation may also uh, cause a radiation arteriopathy that typically occurs years after radiation is administered um, and is children that get radiation in childhood, for, uh, especially when the radiation is directed around the circle of Willis, are at very high risk for developing moya moya later in childhood or in adulthood. Down syndrome, sickle cell disease, neurofibromatosis type 1, and Graves disease are also associations with moya moya arteriopathy. The typical presentation of moya moya is crescendo TIAs. So a child will have uh, multiple transient ischem ischemic attacks that worsen over time. And these are often precipitated by hyperventilation. This is very important to keep in mind when you're evaluating a child with new neurologic symptoms because seizures are so much more common in children than strokes, TIAs in this age group are often misdiagnosed as seizures. So it's really important to keep TIA on your differential diagnosis. The TIAs often progress and ultimately may result in strokes, which can be both watershed strokes and embolic strokes, and can result in cognitive decline, headaches, seizures, and chorea. The chorea uh, is a result of, uh, of the lenticulostriate collateral vessels, as are pictured here. These are vessels that form around the level of the basal ganglia that provide collateral circulation to the brain as the distal internal carotid uh, narrows over time. This gives the classic puff of smoke appearance that we see on angiogram and for which this entity is named. But these collateral vessels can also disrupt the structure of the basal ganglia and cause chorea, which can be a presenting symptom of moya moya. Cardiac stroke is a very common cause of stroke in children and can be related to congenital or acquired heart disease. And these children are at additional risk due to procedures. They may have associated arrhythmias. And patent frame and ovale is a uh, somewhat controversial cause, but something that is worth exploring in children that have had a stroke. The highest risk patients for cardioembolic stroke include those on that, uh, ventricular assist devices, those on ECMO, children undergoing cardiac catheterization, or those with Fontan physiology. Thrombophilia is another diagnosis that we think about when we have a child that has a stroke. It's very important to think about hypercoagulable states in this population. Um, and it's important to remember this concept of developmental hemostasis, where the different uh, coagulation factors really change over time. And the way our clotting system works is, uh, is different based on what stage of development the child is at. 
So because of this, it's very important to compare our values and our testing with age-appropriate norms. Studies that have looked at thrombophilic causes of pediatric stroke are largely underpowered and many results are inconsistent. However, the most common associations that have been found include inherited conditions, including increased lipoprotein A, decreased coagulation inhibitors, including protein C and antithrombin, and genetic mutations. Acquired conditions may include antiphospholipid antibodies, oral contraceptives, and pregnancy. Sickle cell disease is a very strong risk factor for childhood stroke and is certainly something that um, we're not going to be able to cover in the next few minutes. Um, but it's, it's worth recognizing that sickle cell um, predisposes children to stroke very strongly and through many different mechanisms. We know that children with sickle cell are at a very high risk of stroke. 10% um, of patients with sickle cell have an overt stroke by 20 years of age. And there's a high recurrence risk once a child with sickle cell has had a stroke. We also know that children with sickle cell, sickle cell disease are at very high risk of silent cerebral infarction, and that is a risk factor for cognitive and behavioral decline. Fortunately, one of the most successful trials in pediatric stroke is the STOP trial, which, um, in which uh, children that were deemed to be high risk for stroke as measured by transcranial Doppler ultrasound were randomized to either standard of care or chronic exchange transfusions. And those children who received chronic exchange transfusions, which occurred about every three to four weeks, had significant, significantly improved outcomes and decreased stroke risk. And therefore, all children with sickle cell should be getting yearly transcranial Doppler ultrasounds at, starting at two years of age. And if they are, have an elevated cerebral blood flow velocity, they should get, be treated prophylactically with chronic exchange transfusions for stroke prevention. There, is a, there are a lot of other studies that have come after this that look at different variations on stroke prevention, but the STOP trial was really the first one that changed our practice and allowed us to um, decrease the stroke risk in children with sickle cell disease. We won't go over this whole table, but there are many monogenic causes of young stroke that you really do need to think about depending on the clinical scenario. The best guideline I would say is that if there are syndromic symptoms or other organs involved, you should be thinking about genetic causes of stroke. And if the stroke pattern is a small vessel pattern, you should also be thinking about, about monogenic or genetic causes in general. And the reason is that, that small vessel disease is very uncommon in children, and it would suggest that there might be a genetic issue with the blood vessels. Thank you so much for attending this talk. If you have any questions, uh, we would be happy to, to answer those via this email address listed here. Thank you so much and have a great day.